Part 4. How does evolution work? We have discussed the definition of evolution in this video series several times, and so I am sure we all remember that it is common descent with modification. In addition, we have talked about lots of evidence backing evolution, however, we have not explained how evolution works. So, how does evolution work anyway? Before we start talking about the process of evolution, let's talk about selection. Selection refers to how certain individuals of a group tend to survive and reproduce better than others. From this plant at the top of the screen, a farmer harvested a few dozen seeds. Most of these plants seem to be pretty similar to the parent plant, but a few stick out. Some might be smaller, some bitter, some dry, and some larger. So, from which of these plants will the farmer choose to harvest seeds for the next generation? The larger one. And what will these offspring look like? They will be slightly larger than the last generation. This selection of the best plant by the farmer over and over again for several generations leads to a different evolved plant, and that is selection. This example of selection is caused by humans, or a farmer in this case, and is thus called artificial selection. We have used this kind of artificial selection to lead to the evolution of docile farm animals, fat chickens, and larger and disease resistant vegetable strains. Selection can also be caused by nature and is thus called natural selection. For example, rock pocket mice are small mice that live in the desert sands of the southwestern United States. They are mostly light brown in color, but occasionally, due to random mutation, some are born with varying shades of fur that can even be very dark. After a volcanic explosion in this desert, patches of molten lava cooled and left patches of dark rock contrasting the light colored sand. This affected the population of desert mouse, which used its sand color fur as camouflage. For a time after the volcanic eruption, these mice with light colored fur were easily spotted by predators and killed. However, those mice that happened to be born with dark fur were now all of a sudden at an advantage in that they blended into this new dark environment. As you would expect, nature selected for the mice with darker fur. They were selected for by their reduced visibility to predators on the dark rocks. And, just like the farmer, this resulted in a different evolved mouse population after several generations. And nature can put pressure on any trait that helps individuals better survive and reproduce. In the case discussed above, we saw a mouse with better camouflage, but it could just as easily have been a mouse with a trait that made it a faster scurrier, a better climber, or a stronger competitor. Natural selection is one process by which evolution can occur perhaps the most familiar process. But there are several other mechanisms that also contribute to evolution. Before we talk about gene flow, the next mechanism of evolution we will discuss, let's try to understand an important word, allele. Humans get two copies of every gene, one from mom and one from dad. The two copies they get don't have to be identical, and each variation of that gene is called an allele. For example, a gene that codes for eye color could have multiple alleles, and a single person could have one allele that codes for blue eyes and one allele that codes for brown eyes. Descent with modification is basically the change in the frequency of alleles in generations of offspring. They randomly inherit alleles, and some of those combinations are helpful, while others are harmful. Gene flow occurs when alleles flow from one group to another group of the same species by interbreeding. Let us consider the example of the marine snail Littorina saxatellus. This snail is common in the intertidal zone of Western Europe. The intertidal zone across the world is divided into three areas, high, middle, and low. The low area of the intertidal zone is only exposed during a shallow tide. The high area of the intertidal zone is normally exposed and is only covered during high tide. The middle area is somewhere in between. Our snail, Litterina, is found in all three zones. However, the snail has certain alleles that correspond to traits that allow it to survive better in each zone. For example, snails with the A allele survive better in the high area of the intertidal zone where the snails are almost never underwater. As you can guess, 
Snails in the lower intertidal zones have a low frequency of allele A. In the year 1988, toxic algae killed many of the snails in the lower intertidal zone. This graph shows the frequency of allele A in the snails living in different levels of the intertidal zone. As these snails from the lower intertidal zone died, snails from the mid and high zone moved down to take their place. That is gene flow, and it is shown by the fact that the frequency of allele A went up after 1988. The genes from the mid and high intertidal zones flowed to the lower intertidal zone. Then, as natural selection took its course, we see the frequency of allele A go back down into the lower intertidal zone. Mutation is an inherent part of evolution. Mutations occur at a fairly steady rate in most organisms, even humans. Did you know that you have about 250 novel mutations in your DNA that neither of your parents have? This is just the nature of DNA and its replication process. Thankfully, most novel mutations are what we call neutral or silent meaning that they have no measurable effect on an individual's ability to survive and reproduce and therefore are not selected for or against. Some mutations that occur are harmful, while others may even be beneficial. For example, sometime in the history of humans, a mutation occurred that caused both a change in pigment color and a clumping of pigment-making cells, rather than being spread evenly through the skin. This made their skin very white, with splotchy reddish spots that we now call freckles. If these people lived at the equator, this mutation may have been very harmful as pigment cells protect you from the harmful rays of the sun. However, if these people had traveled farther north toward the pole, this mutation may have actually been beneficial as it allowed them to soak up more sunshine and make more vitamin D than other people under the low light conditions. Thus. This mutation, which was random, became more common in populations of humans that lived in the far northern latitudes. Think Vikings. Mutation alone can drive evolution even without a selection force. Sometimes mutations are helpful and can increase survivability, but many times mutations are bad. However, just because a mutation is unfavorable does not mean it will be immediately excised from the population. Thus, mutations can cause a species to evolve towards something that is not well adapted. Let's consider an example from Chernobyl, a site of a nuclear disaster in 1986. Nuclear radiation increases the rate of mutation. That's why movies always seem to depict animals with extra eyes, extra limbs, or other weird characters after a nuclear explosion. Although radiation exposure won't cause a third arm to pop out of your chest, it might cause a high level of mutations in offspring. A highly visible mutation in Ukrainian barn swallows is partial albinism. The partial albino swallow does not survive as well in the wild, as it is more easily spotted by predators. The albino mutant appears rarely under natural conditions, however, it was very prevalent near Chernobyl in the years following the nuclear accident. Site C, the dark bars in the graph, shows a higher incidence of albinism than in Site K because Site C is near Chernobyl. The higher mutation rate leads to more albinism. This is evolution by mutation only. Organisms pick their mates. Because mate choice is not a random process, this can lead to evolution as well. For example, humans are growing taller. Over the past 150 years, humans have increased in average height by about 4 inches. It's believed that this is due to females tending to pick taller mates. Another example of non-random mating as a process of evolution is the peacock. Peahens, or female peacocks, tend to pick the males with the longest, most colorful feathers. Males with short feathers are unimpressive and will mate less often. This non-random method of selecting mates has been a mechanism of the evolution of the long, beautiful, elaborate feathers we associate with peacocks today. The last mechanism we will discuss is genetic drift. Genetic drift is driven by chance and it is not a form of selection. It also tends to have more of an impact on smaller populations. Let's say that we discovered a new habitable planet and we decided to send a family there to populate it. 
that family would multiply and reproduce over several generations. Would the colonization of the new planet be a good representation of the genetic diversity from Earth? Well, what if that original family of astronaut colonizers were of Latino heritage? Then the new planet would be full of people of purely Latino descent. This new population would only include the limited genetic diversity that the original family brought. This is a form of genetic drift that is called the founder effect. Similarly, if all of the Earth was wiped out by nuclear disaster except for the island of Madagascar, what would happen to the diversity on Earth? Would this new population be a good representation of the whole Earth? Well, for starters, there would be almost no people with blue eyes and blonde hair. This new population would only include the limited genetic diversity that the island of Madagascar contained. This form of genetic drift is called the bottleneck effect. Both forms of genetic drift, the bottleneck effect and the founder effect, are important mechanisms of evolution. So, to review, there are five mechanisms of evolution. Natural selection, mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and non-random mating. Each one of plays a role in the changes we see in species over time.